Hello, and welcome to the last session. We are going to be talking about never again. Uh, I think all of us understand that we got some successes, we had some failures, but the real shame will be if we do not learn from this experience. And so what's on the minds of many of us are not only the incredibly important work of dealing with the current pandemic and caring for each other and, and for many people around the world, but the work of making sure we never end up in this situation again. And um, that is not going to happen by simply incremental change. It's going to take some pretty big thinking to get there. Um, so the session is called Never Again Strategies and Scientific Moonshots. And if the goal is not to think incrementally, uh, I am delighted to introduce our, our speaker for the session, who is, I believe, based on scientific measurements, the least incremental person in the world. Um, <laughs> that is Regina Dugan. Um, she was the 19th director of the legendary DARPA and also the first woman to, to direct that agency from 2009 to 2012. She has worked in amazing product innovation at Motorola and Google and Facebook. And um, she is currently the president and CEO of a new and innovative organization called Welcome Leap where the Wellcome Trust, and she'll probably tell you a moment about it, but where the Wellcome Trust decided, again, in a non-incremental fashion that it needed to focus on leaps. Uh, Fortune Magazine has described Regina as one of the world's leading experts on product innovation, quote, the kind that unhinges old ways of operating, juices competition, and creates new growth. They're not explicitly calling her unhinged, but I'm not sure she would object to that because I bet she would find hinges rather constraining. Regina, it is wonderful to have you here. And you're going to talk to us for 10 or 15 minutes. We're then going to hear maybe five minutes from the other two panelists. And then we're going to break into a full discussion with everybody. Over to you. All right. Thank you, Eric. Look, over the years, you and I have both faced many difficult topics, but you know, I have to say this one feels different. In between worrying about my family, about the devastating losses we felt globally, I find myself thinking a lot about Sputnik, which may seem odd, so let me explain why. I believe that this is our Sputnik moment. It is a clear historical example of a determined never again response, and it's a playbook. So Sputnik ignited the space age, and I believe the coronavirus can inspire a health age. So let's go back, 1957, October 4th, a beach ball sized satellite named Sputnik is launched. We're caught in a strategic surprise and arguably that single event started a cascade that changed the world. Now, the response was focused, it was determined, determined to do what was necessary so that we'd never again be so surprised. Now, the resulting efforts didn't just put a man on a moon, they also ushered in a new technology age. So never again wasn't a rhetorical statement, it was a commitment. For a decade, we invested. Greater than 2% of federal spending went to the new frontier of space, 80% of that was R&D. But it wasn't only about increasing the dollars, we also built the new structures necessary to achieve it. So Sputnik led to the creation of DARPA. DARPA has a singular mission, create and prevent strategic surprise. That's an explicit never again mission. And the organizations and those foundations led to decades of breakthroughs. Many of them we know, the internet and GPS, but one you likely don't know, today's mRNA vaccines. So I want to take a moment. At a time when we question government challenge investments in science, we have a vaccine today because of a remarkable scientific advance, mRNA vaccines. I wanna say a few words about that story. So let's level set on vaccines. 
Typically, it takes us three to 10 years to develop a new vaccine. Those vaccines are made in living cellular systems. To this day, the annual flu is made in chicken eggs. So what happened last year? Moderna went from virus sequence to first dosing in humans in 63 days. 63 days, not three to 10 years, 63 days. And less than a year later, we have a vaccine. Now, this is a remarkable achievement. Frankly, it's stunning. And the seeds of this were planted a decade ago at DARPA. So I wanna paint a picture for you. Imagine a nondescript government building, inside of it a conference room lined with whiteboards and some of the best scientific and engineering minds in the country. And we're going through potential new programs and a particular program manager, his name is Dan Wattendorf, who I think is one of the unsung heroes in this story, asks two important what if questions. He asks, what if we have a global pandemic with a novel pathogen, either made by an adversary or made by mother nature, and we don't have a vaccine? It stops the world and we can't wait three to 10 years for a new vaccine. And what if we could change that calculus using mRNA? Now, what you have to understand is that at the time DNA vaccines had been tried, and they made proteins in the body, but they lacked potency. And there were a lot of critics about this. Dan's key insight was that mRNA could perhaps solve two problems. It could provide the instruction set to encode our cells to make the proteins for the vaccine, but also tickle the immune system to produce more and increase the potency. That was Dan's core insight. And the critics said, we have no evidence to suggest this is going to work. And Dan said, we have no evidence to suggest it won't. And if it does, someday it will matter. Well, that day has come. Now, at the time, there were about three people at Moderna and Dan made those investments. He continued the effort there and with others as well. And I believe that the mRNA vaccine will one day be in the top five DARPA contributions to the world, right alongside the internet and GPS. And I've thought a lot about that day in the last months. It was clearly my most important day at DARPA. I just didn't realize it at the time. My dad is 83. He's immune system compromised because he has rheumatoid arthritis. And on the 19th of this month, he and my mom will both receive their first dose of the Moderna mRNA vaccine. So it really does matter. Now, I wanna be clear, DARPA is not a patient organization. I am not an exceedingly patient person. I'm eager for results. And in fact, the agency is often making people excited and uncomfortable at the same time. Now, I raise this because I think COVID has illustrated what might be possible if perhaps we're a little less patient. And in health, particularly going slow is a painful kind of slowness. It's the kind of slowness that's measured in lives we can't save. And I mention this also because the history of mRNA teaches us what might be possible if we had more bold programs designed to create advances in health. I mean, think about this. Is it possible to go from virus sequence to dosing in 63 days? It is. Is it possible to get a vaccine in 10 months instead of 10 years? It is. Never again requires speed and boldness and some provocation. And it requires organizations that are optimized to deliver results on accelerated timescales. They need to be independent and operating beyond consensus. So I think this is central to a never again pandemic strategy, but also to the breakthroughs we need in cancer, in diabetes, in mental health. And this is not, in my mind, only a moral imperative, it's an economic one too. So the big question here is, can we do it again? The answer is yes, we can, but it will take more than just pledging ourselves to a rhetorical mission. Building is everything. We have to build it. After Sputnik, we built DARPA and NASA. And now after 60 years with about 0.5% of the DOD budget, we've had a remarkable track record of breakthroughs. So it's not just the dollars, it's also how they're spent. 
So after COVID, what will we build? Now, there's a few things that are similar because vast transformations require will. So it's not an accident that they most often coincide with hardship. Crisis has a way of synchronizing our commitment to a mission. But there are things that are different too. This is not a nationalistic interest. In fact, certain classes of problems simply defy lines on a map. Climate change is one, global health is another, and I would argue even cyber is a third. So as you mentioned, Eric, Welcome Trust has taken a step in forming LEAP. It's very much modeled after the style of breakthrough work that DARPA does. Think of it as a global health for DARPA, DARPA for global health. And this was started even in 2018, seeded with 300 million global from the start, and we hope eventually public-private. We just stood up operations this year. So that's enough to, uh, to get started without asking too much permission, but certainly not enough to finish the job. We have to focus on breakthroughs at speed. Um, it needs an agile organization that's not consensus-driven so that we can take on more daring types of approaches, advances where there's still doubt, where doubt exists, more breakthroughs like mRNA. So as a first example, we just recently launched a $50 million program that asks some next what ifs. I mean, we went from virus sequence to first dosing in humans in 63 days, and then we faced a long clinical trial. What if we could shorten the trial safely to three months using state-of-the-art systems that replicate human organs and the immune system? I mean, it's already more science than fiction to cultivate functioning human tissue in a lab, even cardiac cells that beat in synchrony. And if such bioengineered systems could shorten a trial by even one month, it could save many lives and avoid trillions in economic damage. So what's the level of investment required? We believe, and we've seen it with DARPA, we can have the breakthrough part of a never again strategy with without a $100 billion investment. DARPA's annual budget is three and a half billion. And let's calibrate, what if this part of our never again strategy needed to be even at a billion per year? How hard is that? Well, a billion per year is 0.01% of the annual federal spending of the G7. It's less than 1% of R&D for the global pharmaceutical companies. It's about 10% of philanthropic spending for the US business roundtable companies alone and about 5% of the top 20 philanthropic organizations. We can do it. So I completely believe that we should not, we should not squander this moment. We need a never again strategy. And I believe we can use this Sputnik-like moment to spark one of the greatest periods of advancement in science and medical history, just like we did in the space age. Uh, the idea here would be to build a health age for the planet and the people that inhabit it. And if you want to be part of that, building that conversation, let's have that conversation, build that future together. So speaking of conversations, Eric, let's move to our panel, right? You're going to moderate it. So let me say a few words about you, my close and longtime colleague. So Eric, of course, is president and founding director of the Broad, a biomedical research institution focused on genomic medicine. He is also, in his spare time, professor of biology at MIT and of systems biology at Harvard Medical School. He has played a pioneering role in all major aspects of the reading, understanding, and medical application of the human genome, including being one of the principal leaders of the International Human Genome Project. He's been active in public policy. This is partly how I know Eric from his time as co-chair of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology from 2009 to 2017. So Eric, over to you. Well, thank you. We're gonna have lots to talk about and I particularly like the fact that you've already queued up the question, okay, we did well, but we should not be satisfied. And I wanna return to that question of 63 days, eight or nine months, and maybe another nine months to distribute. Um, yep. You know, not a bad first step, but not what the goal should be. And so we'll turn to that. And I wanna first though introduce one of our panelists, uh, Dr. Matthew Hepburn, who is the vaccine development lead for Operation Warp Speed. 
I almost don't have to say anything else because just that title, <laughs> Vaccine Development and Lead for Operation Warp Speed, is salient to, um, oh, I don't know, 250 million Americans. So um, I, I will say uh, you, you have served in a number of roles in the military. You've been a program manager at DARPA. You've been lots of things. But I think your current title says it all. I don't know if there's any other job people are, would, are more focused on than that. So tell us, how's it going? What are you thinking? And what's your thoughts so, about uh, how I'm ever again? Uh, uh, first of all, privilege to join you. Uh, privilege to be part of this uh, remarkable conference. What, what, a, what an amazing, uh, germane topic. Um, I, uh, I want to start off with what I'm worried about to answer your question. Uh, you know, we did pretty good, but what's next and how is this going to go? Uh, and I'm going to be, uh, frankly, Debbie Downer for about two minutes. And then I want to uh, give some signs of hope going forward. I think, first of all, we are not done. Like, we are not done with this pandemic. And what I'm concerned about most it, with that fact that we all understand is that we're getting really tired. Uh, you know, the, mm -hmm. the effort of Operation Warp Speed, um, certainly with a, a massive effort within our government and Health and Human Services and Department of Defense, um, the public-private partnership with uh, literally thousands uh, with each of our vaccine, our six vaccine products have literally thousands of people working right now, enrolling patients in clinical trials, scaling manufacturing. Um, and now what we've seen is the national effort to distribute those vaccines. But, but that's just for our nation. I mean, we still have a global pandemic uh, that we need to wrestle with. And, and the, the really hard part right now is almost this, great, we got a vaccine. Um, you know, the, the end is in sight and the pandemic's just going to open because we want that to happen. It's going to just end because we want it to happen so badly uh, because we're so tired. We're so tired as a society with the control measures. We're, we're so tired in the product development space, and now we got to do distribution. And, and we've got to stop this problem globally. We, we have to figure out how to scale from millions to billions in terms of vaccine doses. And if distributing millions uh, and administering millions of doses, how do we get to billions? And we may need boosters, and we may need to be fighting this pandemic over the next couple of years. So, so we are not done, and I, uh, we have to find a way to uh, it's you know it's it's not a sprint it's a marathon but we got to keep running and and how we motivate ourselves as a scientific community how we motivate ourselves as a public health community so that we lead and project to our societies uh, that we have to keep running so I'm I'm worried about that and then I'm even more worried that after that uh, we're going to get into a uh, people are not going to want to mention COVID anymore. So I'm, I'm imagining we return to the quotations of normal. Um, I'm, I'm worried that instead of kind of learning our lessons and catalyzing those for global health, it's going to be, we don't want to talk about vaccines or global health or anything. We want to pretend like it didn't happen again. And then we got to talk about budget deficits and we got to talk about the other problems that we just haven't had the global energy to solve. So, so I'm worried that the fatigue will turn into, if you will, a complacency, and then we won't be prepared for the next one. And I, so I promised you, I was gonna be a little bit down at the beginning, um, but that's why we're having this conference. And that's why I think this conference both is to talk technically on how we make sure that this never happens again, but it's also how we talk emotionally and how we can mm -hmm. you know, listen to what Regina started off with, which was frankly, just very inspiring. Uh, to me personally, I think we we celebrate those victories of healthcare providers, relatives who have now received this vaccine, which is an extraordinary accomplishment. We at Warp Speed celebrate every one of those. It it just keeps me going at the end of the day. Um, but what I'm also super excited about is this idea of at what we are learning now in real time about this entire process. I mean, there are there are literally hundreds of ways that we can innovate and that we can do better in each of these mm -hmm. steps that can, I'm convinced can cut that timeline in half. And, and it's not only cutting the timeline to now, 
which is now is you know millions of doses available in the United States and some millions in some of the other countries. But how we get to billions in in this you know in a compressed timeline. So yes, and and you know of course I'm a DARPA alum like Regina, so absolutely be provocative. You know we need a billion doses in three to six months as we've learned from this pandemic experience, and that we can apply that to global health and everywhere else. But what I, I want to leave you with is two thoughts, and that the first is um, the innovation. That it's tempting to say that the innovation is, is in the laboratory and it's, it, it's among the scientists and especially with the RNA narrative that, that Regina was so eloquent about. There is more innovation to come and we have to keep pushing innovation there. There is massive opportunity in innovation and scaling manufacturing and going mm -hmm. to large scale much shorter in half the time. Innovation in clinical trials, Regina alluded to that and that accelerated product development, getting clinical trials done in half the time I want to emphasize and foot stomp on that. We can, that is, that is right. And there's also administration from what we're seeing roll out right now in the United States. How do you administer vaccine? But are there ways to innovate so that you can vaccinate hundreds or even millions of people in record time? Let's solve those problems too. And I, you know, mm -hmm. I am happy to participate in every conversation about how you know innovation from there in each of those steps. Um, can be transformative. I want to leave you though with what I love about these conferences is that, and what I love about what we've seen with the Operation Warp Speed vaccine is that everybody who said that it couldn't be done, now we can say, well, look, here's one example where it can. And when we do that, frankly, the people who don't really listen are the people that have been doing it the same way for their you know 30 and 40 year career and everywhere else. And, you know, that, that's the establishment. Once we have a fact that it can be done differently, I feel like that just opens the floodgates. And through that opening is really the next generation. It's really those, it's really the people that are in grad school now. It's the junior uh, physicians that are investigators. It's the next generation. It's the, the interns on the manufacturing floor that are now saying, yeah, we can do this differently. And they keep being told they can't. And it's like, Here's the evidence. Here's the evidence for that. And it should really inspire that next generation. And that's what I hope this conference really does is it's like you, the next generation, you're the ones who can say, we're going to question, we're going to be provocative, as Regina said, and we're going to say, here, we can solve the problem that way. And then when the people tell you no, we say, look, look, we, we showed you for this pandemic, it can be done. Mm -hmm. Eric, back over to you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Hepburn, for that. And there couldn't be a better transition to the uh, third speaker on this panel um, because uh, I think he is a fabulous example of this next generation that is coming along. Dr. Manu Prakash is a professor of engineering at Stanford. Uh, he got his, his bachelor's degree at IIT Kanpur and his PhD from my own home institution, MIT and then was a junior fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows, which if you don't know, you probably do, is a very big deal, before joining Stanford, where he's in the Department of Bioengineering. And he runs a really incredibly lively lab, a curiosity-driven lab focused on marine biophysics and frugal science. Uh, focusing on inventing and scaling up solutions for health, ecology, and environmental challenges globally. And Dr. Prakash, thank you so much for coming and telling us what you're thinking about. Um, thanks, everybody. It's just an absolute honor uh, to gather with all of you. Uh, I think one thing that I really want to honestly start with, it's so inspiring to learn from what has worked. Uh, in the last two days, uh, looking back, but also honestly reflecting what has not. In our failings is our preparedness. And I think I heard the most honest conversation in these last two days about those failings. So thank you so much for many of you who brought that on. Uh, and uh, I know it was difficult. I have a few slides. I wanted to just give you a visual cue. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. Um, I came into this uh, for the last 10 years, really focusing on this idea of frugal science, because in my heart as a child, I've always believed that science belongs to everyone. 
and the kinds of equity conversations we were having uh, for for almost a decade. Uh, this idea that uh, science and scientific capacity interfaces with technology when everybody gets a chance to experience science has been the heart of many technologies that we have developed uh, at the root cause of uh, many of the innovations in the past. Uh, so next slide. Uh, so when I started looking at COVID and started seeing things unfolding around the world, and this is literally a summary of uh, an entire year of half a dozen products that we have released and delivered to people around the world, it really felt that equity and access had to be a design parameter. And you know, it started not just from faraway places thinking about developing countries, but it has always been about haves and have nots. Receiving those emails from healthcare workers in the middle of New York saying, can somebody help me with a PPE for my shift tomorrow was really a heartbreaking story. We started looking at uh, why do we throw an N95 mask? Could we truly have a recyclable mask? You know, the technology of that has been around, but the supply was not. We repurposed snorkeling masks to turn them into as effective as an N95 and N99 masks. We asked ourselves a question, why do we depend on supply chains to begin with? Could we manufacture N95 grade masks anywhere in a small hospital, including rural parts of Bangladesh or in a small uh, medical center in New York? And we led to a mechanism to really repurpose a cotton candy machine, really an object that you've probably all seen or at least tasted to make N95 grade filtration materials. Uh, one of the things that has been a, a big focus has been on everybody's talked about ventilators because of its importance in this pandemic, but this is not the last respiratory uh, disease that's going to be around. And when you look at the numbers of one ventilator for 300,000 people in Bangladesh, it really asks a question, how is it possible that for a technology that's been around for at least 30 years, we have failed to deliver these technologies? And from this perspective, we started an open source framework to literally build from scratch an ICU ventilator uh, that will be a reference design, kind of like a browser. I mean, most browsers we are using right now are based on open source reference designs. Uh, and the last one has really been focused on, uh, you know, I was drinking coffee just uh, before coming to this call. Uh, why don't we have home molecular tests? Uh, something as simple as making a cup of coffee. Uh, next slide. Uh, and what I want to share with you, the details of all these projects are online, they're ongoing, but I want to share with you some lessons we learned in how do we design equity and affordability into these projects. The first key lesson was designing with our users. It was extremely important uh, to be on the call and literally not have teams just locally, but literally we have teams, uh, design teams in India, Kenya, Nepal, Bangladesh, uh, all across the U.S., uh, trying to make sure that the users are the central theme of the sets of technologies that we are going to build. That is the only way, unless we can think about this as an opportunity for capacity building, we will never be able to truly deliver these solutions in local context. Uh, next slide. Uh, and, you know, I'm really proud uh, at this moment, uh, after almost a year of work, if we succeed, we are very close to the first. ICU grade ventilator that will actually be manufactured in Africa. And I find it shocking that I have to say this, but ironically, such a critical care technology not being accessible to a large swath of people has uh, really made us realize how weak some of the context of global, there are no global regulatory bodies. You have to go country by country and you have to depend on some other countries. Uh, criteria to be able to hopefully have them accepted. It is absolutely shocking for us if we're going to build a global framework to not have that. Next slide. Um, this is the last thing I want to mention. I think I was reflecting on this idea of moonshot and I don't look at my work as moonshot because I often am in the trenches thinking about how do I make technology accessible to people because when I look at the moon, it feels inaccessible to me. And ironically, the power of the Sputnik is it made 
you know, people could watch the Sputnik, they could see it. And so, I mean, in the context of molecular diagnostics, we're very excited because finally this moment and all this investment in COVID will allow and leverage us to get to the slow pandemics. I mean, the damage that TB and malaria and dengue cause around the world every day is absolutely as important as COVID. And it is so important if we, it would be an, a catastrophic failure if we don't take the technological innovations, the human capital and uh, much of infrastructure that we have raised and make sure that we are not forgetting all these other diseases that are with us. So I think I'm very proud and excited about the fact that we should be able to leverage as technologists much of what we have developed along the way uh, and make it accessible for a broader group of diseases and truly bring equity to the heart and center of technology development. I'll pass it back to you, Eric. Well, Dr. Prakash, that was great. And, and I wanna uh, congratulate you because you've just been appointed the head of a $2 billion <laughs> a year agency that is going to try to organize efforts around the world so that, as you say, developing it with primarily focused on these highly affordable solutions with the insights that come around the world. And I was curious in your first two minutes in office, what's the plan for how you're going to bring people together, how you're going to you know, try to identify the key needs, how you're going to make projects that cut across boundaries? I'm, I'm really curious. And congratulations again on the appointment. <laughs> Uh, that's a tough one. Uh, you know, I'm a nuts and bolts kind of a person. So I think for me personally, the act of doing is really how uh, organizations are built. And so if I was to take that seriously, one important aspect has been the regulatory challenges around uh, designing technologies in an affordable context. I mean, affordability is not a bad word, but frankly, in healthcare, for some reason, it has become this perspective that, uh, uh, and again, I mean, that leads to a lot of challenges that we know. So uh, having an arm of an organization like this that is truly global and asks the question, can it be a centralized regulatory body that allows for technologies to be verified has the depth and wisdom of something like the FDA because we have to agree that because of the history of organizations like this, they bring the kind of talent that is sometimes lacking globally. Uh, and then the other part of this uh, mission has to be about the young people uh, that Matthew just alluded towards. If we don't do cap capacity building, uh, you know, when I think of technologies for us, I often think about these as reference designs because these will happen. Technology will always be outdoing itself. And as part of most of our efforts, when we are thinking of trying to solve a problem, we miss the education piece. So this entity, you know, at least 25% of its time really needs to be the young engineers in every corner of the world should really look at health age as the next challenge, but make sure that they feel that they have the capacity to do it. And frankly, I mean, uh, ironically, we teach at places like Stanford and MIT, not every kid has to come there before they can be part of the solution. And how do we leverage the kind of innovation that we are all so proud of? But really, I mean, currently half the talent in the world uh, just does, is not even in the game. So I think it would well, be a phenomenal way to start. Uh, I, if that's what you can do with two minutes notice, I'm looking forward to the 48 hour version and I hope you'll email <laughs> it to me because that was awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Prakash. So Dr. Hepburn, I'm on, I'm, I'm, I regret since, since you know, you're in the Debbie Downer camp here, I'll join you as a Debbie Downer. All these efforts are going on and it turns out, I've just heard, that not only do we have, of course, this mutation that accelerates transmission dramatically, but there is, you know, evidence, um, not definitive yet, but there's evidence that we might see, uh, might already have, or in any case could see vaccine escape mutants. And so I have in the back of my mind the scary prospect of something that transmits with a much higher R naught and 
is a vaccine escape mutant. So suddenly, just as you're vaccinating the world, the whole population is still susceptible to something with a bigger R naught. And of course, we're exhausted, but we should have legs up. What's Operation Warp Speed's plan to go to like warp five? <laughs> we need your help. <laughs> so um, I do, uh, if, if you will allow me, I want to build on one, a couple things Manu said that are uh, of course, I hope our take course. homes for every Nobody person. Nobody has to audience. actually answer my question. I'm just no, 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 no. You know, <laughs> but, well, especially when they're hard. If it's a really hard question, uh, you know, media training, like to defer. No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer it. But Manu struck a chord with me uh, uh, in terms of regulatory. He is absolutely right um, in terms of the need for global regulatory approaches. And but but to even expand that. You know, we don't use the words regulatory and innovation in the same sentence. We say the opposite. And regulatory is assumed to be, uh, this is the static, this is the group you have to fight against if you want to innovate and try something different. And we need to completely reverse the paradigm. And we see regulatory experts who, who excel at this, and we need, to, we need to nourish that. That needs to be 10x. We need to put resources into regulatory innovation. And they need to take Manu's invention and say, good, then this is how we're going to set the precedent for rapid quality reading. But, but regulatory is not something to dismiss either. What they do for us is they insist on quality and reproducibility, which is oftentimes, frankly, where innovation fails. The innovation looks great and it's flashy, um, but you have to establish the quality and the reproducibility. But when you marry those two concepts, you win. I think the second is, I'm excited about the education comment, and I would, again, to be a little bit provocative, to we have to also avoid miseducation. Miseducation is it can't be done. Miseducation it's, is it takes, it takes regulatory a year to review something. We, ha we have to get our next generation used to the, you know, it takes six months to develop a vaccine, and then, then that becomes the norm. Um, the Debbie Downer comment on and variance is a, is, a, is a specific example of, of a lot of the challenges that are ahead. The other is the duration of protection. So vaccines yep. can be great. No, no, no one's messaging you're getting lifelong protection from your, your two shots of Moderna vaccine. So, so I, again, I'm trying to get us in a, you know, the, the hard part is there is power in sprint. Like we've sprinted in Operation Warp Speed marathon analogy. And I, I that's, yeah. I think, I think what we have to do is really figure out how we can be a resilient scientific and public health community so that every one of us that's been working 80 hours a week since January, uh, you know, we, we, we got, we, we just can't, we got to figure out how we transition into more of a sustainable approach um, your, as your we address comments. this. Yeah, you're coming. But, but I will say just, just to finish yeah. specifically on the variant, it's a, it's a great example of why we need home diagnostics, of why we need uh, you know worldwide sequencing capability, coordination. All there, there's so many aspects of scientific of scientific endeavor that we need to leverage and coordinate. Our intention at Warp Speed is we want to be at the tip of the sphere because we've been working on the clinical trials of these vaccines in places where these variants are starting to crop up. So we will be able, and it's frankly, it's the beauty of international cooperation. When we do international clinical trials, we understand how our products work in the diversity of settings where this outbreak is. Um, so that's, that pays benefits because then we can understand if the vaccine works better where different strains are currently circulating. So I pledge you that that's, we are, we are doing that now. We're not doing that alone. We're plugged into government processes led by, I think, some of the smartest people in the world at the National Institute of Health and CDC. Um, but it is a for a topic for future conversation. Is it's not a government solution. We have to bring, a, you know, we have to globally go after these variants and understand them in real time. Well, yeah, I'll, ju Eric, I'll just say I, wanna, I think this I want to add yeah. here. Yeah. Regina, jump right in. I just want to add, and I, I want to add and echo something that Matt said a little earlier. You know, time is not our friend here. Part of our part of our never again strategy has got to be to shrink this overall timeline. 
we, we are, I think we can be very grateful that we have a vaccine in the time period that we have it. But a vaccine is not a vaccination program. We still have the regulatory piece to get through. We need mechanisms by which we can safely shorten that trial, ramp manufacturing, globally distribute, reduce the burden on healthcare distribution for that. Can we, for example, use the latest advances in microneedle arrays so that we could maybe administer the vaccines in future without a healthcare worker, a self-administered patch on the shoulder. These are the kinds of things that have virtuous cycle types of effects, because if we shrink that timeline, we leave less time for the virus in the environment to be mutating and then creating a next wave of infections. That's what we have to focus on. That entire time constant has to come down and it has to be distributed globally. The capacity has to be distributed globally. I, I think that is so clear from, from this, Regina. Thank you for emphasizing it. I think in my particular hard comment for Dr. Hepper, let me note, I think it connects back to your regulatory comment. Suppose in fact we have an escape mutant. Well, in theory, you could quickly make an RNA for that alternative sequence, and you could even combine it in the current vaccine by putting in two alleles into the same vaccine. From a technical point of view, we have the manufacturing capacity, we have whatever we got, we could do this. What's the regulatory path for approving that? <laughs> Should we be thinking about that right this minute, that we might indeed have to have essentially a poly, you know, allelic, uh, vaccine, and we know how to do it technically. Do we know that need another nine months to approve it? Do we do we do we have some kind of a test that it's going to be okay? And so I think it actually may not even be just the next pandemic. This one is going to give us a chance to push mm. the boundaries. All of you are saying it's an integrated system. We have to think about it that way. And studying integrated systems is not what often we tend to do in laboratories, but it is what we tend to do when we build things that work in the world. I am so grateful to this panel for inspiring us, scaring us. Both are, are very important to getting stuff done. And also for, for the work that you're doing, uh, you know, all of you are, are doing right now. It's a great example. So Thank you. I'm going to turn over to I don't know who yet because it's the end of our session and I don't quite know what happens, but you guys were awesome and we didn't even practice it. So it was really good. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Eric. And, and thank you for My actually pleasure. Thank you.